My name is Barbara Ellis. I am a member of the 9-11 uh, Alliance for Truth. Uh, it is my great honor tonight to introduce Lauren Murray, who is probably the world expert on depleted uranium. Some of you were at the presentation last night, uh, but tonight she's going to be talking about 9-11. Uh, just a little bio here. <clears throat> uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, she's, she's among those uh, who worked at Livermore Labs uh, and is a whistleblower after all the stuff she saw, what they were doing with this stuff, and you heard a lot about that. But she also is an expert on 9-11 because they are coordinated. There's all kinds of things that are going on at the same time. Just a little uh, bio. Uh, <clears throat> she was a, um, uh, she's a military brat, she told me, she's, and that's the Marines. Uh, and she was always moving from base to base. And we were talking today, this morning, at Lincoln High School, 10 schools in 12 years, and that makes a loner, but it also makes a very good student because that's what you're going to excel in. And her, her love was uh, in the woods there, you become botany, science-minded, and math-minded, and she found and f fell in love with science. Uh, and uh, you begin to get very curious and hardworking. Uh, <clears throat> she's... Um, Anyway, when she got into a Quaker school, she was telling me, uh, she was in a boarding school when she was ju a junior, uh, she found that the students, especially the co-eds, really excelled in science. They were encouraged, you know, this is a boy's subject, they were encouraged to do this, to excel. And she was telling me she fit right in, uh, which is a wonderful thing to do. Uh, she um, also, when you get in that kind of a, a environment, you begin to question authority, question things that they say are true, which you have to be as a scientist. And also with 9-11, hey, two planes hit the building, and they're terrible, and let's go get them, and Osama, no question at all, except for those of us who are involved in the 9-11 movement. And there are millions, there are millions. Uh, <clears throat> she um, learned to do that. The, um, uh, she has two degrees, uh, both from UC. Uh, the first one is in geology from Davis, and the second one is in Middle Eastern Studies uh, at uh, uh, Berkeley, uh, that branch. And she's, uh, 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 her uh, doctorate uh, will be in geosciences. So she's lectured all over the world, as you must know. She's been in 46 countries doing field research, but also lecturing. And some of you have heard her talk. You know, I mean, uh, gifted, gifted, and also what we used to call syncretic. It moves from uh, uh, DU, but also from 9-11, and also from banking industries. It is really all-encompassing. That's why I say it's, it's uh, very syncretic. <clears throat> uh, she, as you probably know, was at Livermore Labs as a, uh, geoscience, as a scientist. Uh, and I say, I say to her uh, that you're in the same tradition as Karen Silkwood, as a whistleblower, because she couldn't stand that, seeing, finding out what they were doing. Uh, and we talk about Silkwood, we talk about Aaron um, Brekovich, Brekovich uh, which they're now doing the same kind of stuff, as you know, in, um, uh, uh, it's near the Kuwaiti border. And I think some of you know well, I don't want to get into you here. <laughs> we want to stick to 9-11. Uh, but she's been on countless radio shows, countless uh, TV sh interviews. Uh, some of you, we noticed last night, a lot of people heard her interview and came because of the interview that Dave Mazza on Voices from the Edge did on KBU. Uh, uh, and uh, there are, and uh, Glenn made copies. I got one of the first that you made. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in this country, she's been involved with peace groups, sustainability groups, 9-11 groups, uh, and of course uh, uh, with Gulf War syndrome. And um, anyway, she's the she's a former member of the City of Berkeley's Environmental Commission, because everything seems to hook on the environment, as you probably know. Uh, she's an organizer of the World Committee on Radi Radiation Risk, uh, and we are very very honored that uh, a 9-11 group hosts her visit this week. So I present to you <coughs> Lauren Murray. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, Margaret. Thank you. Well, most of the time I'm in my apartment in Berkeley writing 
I do research and write about 18 hours a day, and I've been doing this since the year 2000. Um, and I must say that coming to Portland has been Mr. Toe's wild ride with all of the wonderful people that I've met here. And this morning, Tim dragged me out of bed and made me get up at 6.15 I was talking to his daughter until quarter to one in the morning last <laughs> night. And we went to a high school and I did a presentation there. And then um, Barbara said, well, what do you want to do today? We're sitting in a coffee house. And I said, oh, why don't you just take me around Portland and tell me about the history here? She said, that's way too boring. Let's go to the legislature. It just opened today. <laughs> so off we went. We went through um, uh, the depleted uranium bills in the library. Then we went to the legislature and started knocking on doors and meeting legislators. They're unpacking boxes in their new offices. And um, then, she, then we went to some offices and got some information. Then she said, let's go to the opening of the legislature at 2.30. And um, we didn't even know there was a depleted uranium bill introduced to be introduced in this session. It only meets every other year. And so the second bill that they introduced, they read into the record, was depleted uranium. And we looked at each other and said, oh my god. So um, then we came back, and here we are. And um, I guess I can sleep when I'm old. <laughs> but um, this is a, a really great area for activism. It's really been a pleasure. It was a wonderful audience last night at the Quaker Meeting House. And I'm really happy to see some of the faces from last night and new faces tonight, too, and welcome. So um, I worked at the Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab from 1989 to 91. And I don't know if it was a time warp or a visit into insanity or uh, all I know is radiation is different, <laughs> and it sure is. Um, and while I was there, I learned absolutely nothing about radiation because they don't want you to know anything about it. Because if people knew about radiation and the public health effects and the environmental effects, they could never get anyone to work in those bomb factories. So um, it was all secrecy and compartmentalized. And I always had lots of friends, but I really couldn't really make friends there. It was just so weird. And um, so I left. And um, later on, I met, I was invited to Japan in the year 2000. And that's when I began to get very, very interested in the issue of radiation. It was really going to Hiroshima in Nagasaki and meeting the living survivors of those two horrific bombings. And it completely changed my life. I said in the peace museums in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I have to work on this issue the rest of my life because I know I can make a contribution. But I'm not working in a bomb factory or for a corporation or for a government. I'm working for the citizens of the world and for all living things. And it's been very, very interesting and very fascinating. Now, the way I got involved in 9-11 is um, I was living with a friend who is in a wheelchair. He's paralyzed from the, the waist down from a teenage accident. And he's a news stringer, so he goes all over the Bay Area, especially into inner cities, where he videotapes news and sells it to the TV stations. And so um, one of the scientists I work with, she's a medical doctor in Washington, D.C., about four years ago, she called me up on Christmas, and she said, well, what did you do for Christmas? And I said, well, three homicides, a rape, um, four car accidents <laughs> and, 
and that's what I did. Uh, that's what we did on, on holidays because they were the biggest story and the biggest revenue times. When 9-11 happened, he came in and knocked on the door. I was sleeping in the morning and he said, oh, a plane just hit the Pentagon. And I said, oh, come on. And then he came back and he said, another plane just hit the Pentagon. And he used to ex exaggerate sometimes. But I kind of thought I better get up and look at the TV. And I saw it replaying and replaying all day. And I said, we're not going to have any income from news stories for a number of months. And I went out and bought a 30-pound sack of pinto beans. <laughs> I know how to cook beans a different way every night for five months. <laughs> because we didn't sell another news story until December. <laughs> and um, now on the day of 9-11, when that happened, then we saw the plane hit the, um, yeah, the plane hit the Pentagon. And I called up this medical doctor, Dr. Jeanette Sherman, who I had just done a press conference in Hunters Point Naval Shipyard with in South San Francisco three days before. And I said, Jeanette, she's a radiation expert too, and she had a Geiger counter in her purse to measure radiation. I said, get your Geiger counter out. She was 12 miles downwind from the Pentagon. And I said, turn it on and start doing air monitoring because commercial planes and military planes have depleted uranium as ballast in them. You know the lead lugs that you put on tires to balance them, yeah. they use depleted uranium ballast in airplanes along the wings and the tail to balance the plane, just the same way we balance tires. You mean the World Trade Center or the Pentagon? The Pentagon. <clears throat> what uh, means is you said that your friend said that two planes had hit the Pentagon. Is that actually? Oh, oh in the lit... Is no, that in the what he said or, or oh no, he was no, he said two planes hit the World Trade Center, okay. and then I called her when the plane hit the Pentagon, and I said, "Get your Geiger counter out and start air monitoring." This is two two hours later, yeah. and um, so she started monitoring, and I said, "Take photos," and she called me back the next day to give me a report, and she said the radiation levels, twelve miles from the Pentagon are 10 times higher than normal background levels. And I said, okay, Jeanette, I want you to call HAZMAT, the emergency responders who are working at the Pentagon. They need to be in the highest level of protective gear with air tanks on their backs, no air filters or gas masks, because these nanoparticles go right through the air filters and through protective clothing, but at least they would be much more protected if they were using air tanks. She said, I don't trust the government. I'm not calling anyone in the government, but she called an NGO, a non-governmental organization, and they contacted the EPA and the other um, uh, emergency resp responder organizations. Well, two days later, the EPA radiation expert for that region called that NGO back and said the um, crash site rubble at the Pentagon is radioactive. We believe it's depleted uranium, but we're not worried about the radiation. We're worried about the lead splattered around from the solder in the airplane. Huh? Well, well I'm going to get to that. I'm getting to that. See, at that time, I thought it was a commercial plane. And I was worried about the depleted uranium ballast. So we got a confirmation two, two days later from the EPA that the crash site rubble was radioactive. Well, then Major Doug Rocky sent me U.S. Army aerial photos from an Army helicopter uh, taken looking down on the Pentagon in the entry hall um, right after the impact and before that section of the Pentagon collapsed. And I looked at those photos and I said, oh, that's about a 16-foot 
perfectly round diameter bullet hole through the Pentagon. There wasn't a blade of grass on the ground singed out of place. There wasn't any detritus or crash site rubble on the lawn at all. And I said, oh, where's the airplane? <laughs> this, this isn't an airplane. This is a kinetic energy penetrator. And so Major Doug Rocky, who's a depleted uranium whistleblower and has um, extensive contacts in the Pentagon, in the CIA, um, throughout the military establishment, he emailed me, you know, he's the one who sent me the helicopter photos, and he said, oh, I got an email from a colonel in the Pentagon 20 minutes after the impact. He said a cruise missile had just hit the Pentagon. Rumsfeld has said in three different press conferences, and one of them is still on the Pentagon press, uh, press room uh, web page, that a missile hit the Pentagon. He said it three different times. They were senior moments, but <laughs> <laughs> he still said it. And you know, these people are liars. They've lied all their lives. They've lied their way into the, their jobs. They've lied their way into the top of government. And um, they've lied their ways through these false flag um, um, actions and, and uh, programs and projects. And they're just used to lying, and they don't even care, you know, if you catch them. They just don't really care. They really think they're beyond accountability, <laughs> and most of them are. Um, and I think making them accountable is not as important as presenting the truth to ourselves. They're crazy. They're psychopaths. They're sociopaths sociopaths, they're completely insane. And so we cannot take logical arguments and try to make sense out of their insanity. It just doesn't work. So I think we need to, the citizens who are interested in these issues, need to focus on the geopolitical picture, the reasons for a false flag operation like that, the history going back to Operation Northwoods for an operation like that, and then who benefited, who would be able to carry out a, a very, very complex, very sophisticated operation like that. It wasn't Arabs with box cutters who couldn't fly airplanes. That's just ludicrous. And we also need to look at the media and hold the media accountable because they're part of the lie, part of the distraction, and part of the cover-up, too. In fact, they never could have fooled us without the media being extremely complicit. The media has been a key factor. So, um, so also I got, I started looking all over the internet for photos, and I saw emergency responders in full protective gear and gas masks with their, their dogs, their, their um, bloodhounds and stuff, decontaminating at the Pentagon. And I said, why would they be decontaminating if they didn't know it was contaminated and with, with radiation for sure? Then I got photos of the exit hole. And this is after this object went through five retrofitted walls of the Pentagon. That's a pretty robust uh, uh, amount of resistance. And painted on the exit hole, which was only a few feet smaller than the entr entrance hole, was in great big letters, it was painted by the crash site inspectors, punch out hole. Punch out hole is the term the military uses on their gunnery ranges where they go to the back of a target and they examine the punch out holes from the ammunition they've shot at the target entering on the opposite side. So um, somebody sure does know that a missile hit the Pentagon and the depleted uranium 
is not from the airplane ballast of a non-existent airplane. It's from the depleted uranium warhead in the cruise missile that allows it to penetrate all of that dense retrofitted building material. Now, Doug Rocky also told me that a friend of his is an expert in military demolition and explosives. And his friend said, hey, Doug, that's just a classic cookie cutter, military cookie cutter demolition that took down that section of the Pentagon. So it's really good to go to military sources if you're able to. And um, you know it takes time. It's a whole process of gathering information and looking at pictures carefully and com comparing sources. And um, it's a time for critical thinking and it takes time and, and you have to be very patient. And in the meantime, the disinformation marine machine is roaring up and blasting out this disinfo cannon fodder and spraying it all over the country and all over the media and all over the internet. And so that's what I call the briar patch. And they drag people into the briar patch. It's a briar patch. And then they start fighting with each other and trying to get out and, and attacking each other. And um, the disinfo for 9-11 has been carried out exactly the same way the FBI and Pro and the CIA did it for the JFK assassination, for the Martin Luther King assassination, for the Bobby Kennedy assassination. It's all the same way because it always works. Yeah, and so shame on us to be tricked each time the same way. But, you know, people forget they wait about 20 years before they wage another uh, big psycho trauma on the American public. Um, and I can tell you, it went much further than the United States. 9-11 is the U.S. issue of most interest to people in other countries. Now, what did people in other countries say about 9-11? Well, almost all of them said the immediate reaction was, man, that was an inside job, you know, because they've seen it in their own countries. They've seen many, many wars, centuries, decades, millennia of wars in their own countries. Americans have been protected from those experiences. Well, we're a very young country. We're only 250 some years old. And so we don't have you know, the wisdom from the experience of being exposed over and over and over again to wars and, and false flags. And, um, and so Americans aren't so aware. It doesn't mean that they can't become aware. We have to become aware now because they've fleeced this whole country. And the wars, the false flag operations, the disinfo have all been set up to confuse and uh, confuse the public, uh, obscure what they're doing, and then to use it as a cover to carry out uh, all these criminal activities. And they are truly criminal. So 9-11 um, so is really a very, very, very opportune uh, uh, lesson for us to learn a lot about how they do things. But we have to stay out of the briar patch. We have to stay objective. And we have to share information with each other and also respect each other. It's a discussion, an ongoing discussion. And in the scientific process, you, you never get to the final, ultimate answer. What you're really trying to do is to consider many things and narrow it down and narrow it down to a better and better answer. But the goal of knowing exactly what happened or having the final word doesn't matter. It's just, just that you're in a continuing process of refining the answer and getting it more focused and always adding more information. So, um, so it was pretty obvious to me that uh, at the Pentagon, we're the only entity there with any control is the military, 
And they have underground missiles. They have missiles on the roof of the Pentagon. It's probably the most protected building in the world. So how could missiles or planes or whatever it, it is fly into that building? And where's the film? Yeah, where's the film? Now, uh, some other clues as to who in the military might be involved um, is that the missile impacted naval intelligence that had just been retrofitted. That was the first wall, behind the first wall that the missile impacted, was naval intelligence. They had not moved back in, so nobody was killed. In the floor above, Doug Rocky sent me Officer Magazine, and it's an Army publication for officers. Um, there was an inter interview with a woman, a civilian employee, who worked um, on the floor right above the impact. And she said, well, we were all standing around in our offices watching the World Trade Center planes flying into the in and um, and she said it was really kind of very Orwellian you know we were watching that and then uh, right below where she was standing all of a sudden there's this big noise and she said we really couldn't quite believe it but the missile hit or whatever it was hit right below us and um, she said I called my husband and said you better come and get me and um, she said everyone walked out of their offices and off of that floor and not a single person had any amount of injury whatsoever. Now how can that happen five feet above where a plane hit? Uh, it, it was a missile. And um, um, so that, that was another, um, that was the Navy. Then the missile went through accounting. And accounting is where the three and a half trillion dollars dis disappeared in the Pentagon. And so immediately after that happened, the Pentagon said, Rumsfeld said, well, now we can't find out where the three and a half trillion went because 80 accountants are dead and all the records are gone. It destroyed all the computers. I mean, you only have one copy of receipts? And it, and only one set of books? I don't think so. So, um, so I, I really think um, that the Pentagon should be the real focus of uh, Pentagon, of 9-11 studies and research because there's no one else who could possibly be involved there other than the military. Um, so after, uh, and all those emergency responder workers, um, they're all sick and dying for, at the Pentagon. So then I started getting involved with the, um, the World Trade Center and a reporter named Christopher Bolin, um, I helped him a lot. I introduced him to the Manhattan Project scientists who taught me a lot of what I know. And we started really very critically looking at uh, the World Trade Center. Now, a lot of things had to happen to set up strategically by chess moves the right people in the right key positions to cover up 9-11 at the World Trade Center. Now, um, the World Trade Center had high occupancy. It was owned by the New York Port Authority and the property owners in the Tribeca area, which is uh, a little bit distant from the World Trade Center, but there are a lot of office buildings there, um, had very low occupancy. It was like below 50 percent. It was 30 percent. And people like Mort Zuckerman, who owns the New York Daily News, is a big property owner. And these property owners were not happy about this um, loss of occupancy in their buildings. It was cost, they were losing money. Uh, another clue is that I was in Japan and a Japanese woman who was a, um, an art dealer was in New York City working then in the art dealer world and she said, Loren, 
um, a lot of the um, the Jewish art dealers in New York City had their artwork hanging in the World Trade Center buildings. She said, well, it was all removed six weeks before 9-11. And then our new senator from Minnesota, Al Franken, wrote in his book, what's his book called? Al Franken's book? Um, a big fat liar. <laughs> it's something like that. It's, yeah. yeah. He's got several yeah. It's something yeah. like that. And he said, a lot of people, he wrote this himself in his own book. You can see it online. It's on the internet. Um, Google has the whole book on the internet. He said, well, um, he said a lot of people said, uh, have said that um, the Jewish people were warned ahead of time about 9-11. And he said, to be perfectly frank, I got the Jew call. <laughs> and he said, uh, I worked in the World Trade Center. That's my office where I went to write. And he said, the day before, former Mayor Ed Koch gave me a call and said, Al, don't go to work on... He gave the Jewish calendar day and date for 9-11. He said, don't go to work that day. Hmm. And so Al Franken didn't. And, um, and so now he survived. And now we have him as a new senator in the, in the, in the Senate. Um, so uh, there's all this anecdotal evidence. There's, um, it's humorous. It's sad. But it's all true. How can we disregard it? Now, I started to get really interested in the science of what happened at the World Trade Center because I'm a geoscientist and very tiny particles are what I study. Atmospheric dust. I was studying the history of the Earth's magnetic field and you study it by looking at the dust particles on the seafloor that accumulate for 20 million years. You demagnetize them and you study the, um, the um, changes in the Earth's magnetic field. But I fell in love with, with dust. It's really interesting. <laughs> it is really interesting. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah. I live in California. I have a lot of dust in my house, too. So um, I began to... Um, look at different presentations. I went to Japan and participated in the first 9-11 conference in Japan in 2006, October. And uh, uh, Willie Rodriguez was there. Very personable, very, very nice, very charming man. And he has a lovely new wife who was a journalist in Ecuador. So they're both very savvy. And I thought he was absolutely sincere absolutely honest and um, he's, he's very gracious and, and very warm-hearted and, and generous and I didn't think I didn't think he was being deceitful about anything I think he was having a really hard time getting anyone to believe that he was telling the truth and I, I think he was telling the truth um, also on that stage was uh, Yumi Kikuchi, who's the best activist in Japan, and she had organized this 9-11 conference. Um, Jimmy Walter was there. He's very sincere. He's also a very, very nice person. And um, uh, Benjamin Fulford, who is a, a Canadian working in um, Japan. And he used to be the Asian uh, chief for Forbes magazine. So um, he's written some books. And so we um, went to the conference. Yumi Kikuchi had sold out 600 tickets a month before the conference. We arrived there, and 400 extra people showed up. They wanted to come to the conference, too. There was media from all over the world, Al Jazeera and the BBC and um, Reuters, and it was great. And um, those 400 people had to sit on the floor cross-legged for the entire day between where the seats ended and the stage began. And that is the most successful conference 
Yumi's ever organized. The next day, we took the speakers and video clips from the best uh, videos on 9-11 on to the Japanese legislature. And she said, I had the best turnout of members of the Japanese parliament from all parties. There were right-wingers, there were moderates, there were opposition party, there were independents, there were communists. They all came to the press conference. It was really, uh, it was really kind of very surprising. And um, of course, we know now that a parliament member is, has gone around the world, a Japanese parliament member, talking about 9-11, and he's gotten a lot of publicity. And you know what Mae West said, there is no such thing as bad publicity, <laughs> right? Yeah, right? Right. So, um, Christopher Bolin, um, I told him about reports on the particle size at the World Trade Center, which Dr. Thomas Cahill had conducted through air monitoring a mile downwind from the World Trade Center from the roof of a, a skyscraper, a tall building. And the air monitoring equipment that you need to study very small particles is not filters. It's very sophisticated, extremely intricately designed um, air monitoring equipment. And I saw Dr. Cahill's report. It's this thick. And what he said, which did get into the mainstream media, or kind of mainstream on the internet media, he said he measured the highest concentration of nanoparticles or ultrafine particles ever measured in an air sample in the United States. Now, he started a group called the Delta Group, an international consortium of scientists from all over the world. They study air pollution over cities all over the world. They use lasers and other very sophisticated equipment. NASA and NOAA and other federal agencies from the United States and other countries are involved in it. They're the best air monitors and pollution researchers in the world. So I think that what he said and what he reported, that we can trust that, but we should also take that as a research pathway to give us some more answers about what happened at the World Trade Center. Another thing he said was that they measured the highest concentration of metals in an air sample ever measured in the United States. Now, in the body, metals control the folding of proteins and many of the processes in the cell and vital processes that make it possible for life to happen. And so when you're inhaling a whole lot of metals that are not specific, specifically needed for certain processes, you're going to start throwing wild cards all over in the body that, that cause a lot of haywire things to happen. And we know today that these poor emergency responders at the World Trade Center and at the Pentagon have had horrible health problems. Many have died of cancer because these tiny nanoparticles, everybody has cancer cells in their body. It's in everybody's body. It's our immune system that keeps them in check. But these nanoparticles are highly charged. They have a nonspecific catalyst effect. And they just turn on and turn off processes like, um, like it's like letting a whole bunch of kindergarten gardeners in a room with a bunch of uh, light switches. And they just um, go hog wild. Well, that's what these little tiny invisible molecules do. They're vital to life functioning properly. Um, so Dr. Cahill also reported very high levels of uranium measured in the air monitoring um, study that he did. Now, um, um, not plasterboard, but um, sheetrock is made out of a mineral. It's a clay mineral that has a lot of uranium in it. So the uranium could be out of that. But we looked very carefully with, micros with um, 
uh, uh, hand lenses at the photos and we saw projectiles flying out, three of them flying out of uh, the impact site uh, on, on one of the World Trade Center buildings. And they were smoking a drab olive color, two of them were, and um, that is the color of depleted uranium burning. Now, um, William Rodriguez also said that he had the key to all the rooms in both of the buildings, and there was one uh, floor. He said, I just got this horrible feeling. This is a few days before 9-11. He said, I just had this horrible feeling not to go and unlock that door and do my inspection of that floor. So he just totally avoided it. But um, there were certainly explosives in the buildings. Uh, thermite and thermate we know was used. It's been chemically detected there. But thermite and thermate, hi Barry, is a chemical explosive. And it cannot, it's not, it doesn't release enough energy to break the molecule, the molecular bonds, in the volume of material at the World Trade Center that basically just disappeared up into even the upper atmosphere. Um, it's incredible as a particle scientist to see the photos that um, I went to the Madison, Wisconsin conference and Judy Wood had photos that were U.S. government official photos from NIST, from the EPA, from the USGS, from the EPA, did I say EPA, um, and FEMA. Um, and man, we were sitting there at the Madison, Wisconsin conference seeing all these new photos and evidence and um, Major Doug Rocky was at that conference and he turned around to me, he said, oh, I've never seen these photos. This is incredible. And when a building is demolished, um, the rubble pile should be one-third the height of the building. And so if a building is a hundred stories high, there should be about 35 feet of rubble. When you look at those aerial photos straight down into the footprint of the two World Trade Center buildings, there's bare dirt. There isn't a piece of building material. It's gone. Those buildings vaporize. They disappeared. They just are not there. And what's really interesting is you see these um, circles in the dirt that are perfectly geometric geometrically round circles with a diameter of about 22 feet. And those are evidence of uh, beam weapons. Now, there was also a 60-foot hole in one of the streets that uh, bordered the World Trade Center buildings. And uh, Judy Wood said, how did that hole get there? I mean, it wasn't there <laughs> in the morning uh, of 9-11, but after the, the, these things happened, there was a 60-foot hole. Nobody was digging. There weren't any bulldozers. There weren't any, uh, any, there was not, uh, what, you know, where, how did that happen? It just suddenly was there. Um, another very, very strange thing is the cars that were burned um, in parking lots blocks from the World Trade Center. Now, um, Parts of the paint was blistered. There were rusted spots. Rust is oxidation of iron that happens over a long time, and moisture is usually usually involved. How how were these trucks and cars and uh, parts of the buildings, the steel beams? Steel does not rust. How come there was rust on them? There was a different physical process that caused these anomalies or unusual um, um, oxidation and chemical reactions that can't be explained with anything that we know uh, of normal controlled demolitions. 
Um, now, what's also very strange is that if you looked at the cars sideways, the metal engine blocks were missing. You could see through holes right through the side of the car. There was no engine. Now, what process would make hundreds of car engines disappear? I don't know, but I believe that iron is a major part of the harp system or these exotic beam weapons because I've studied um, other parts of harp. I've done research on it. I worked at Livermore and Livermore is where the harp antenna and harp mind control and other harp technologies were developed in partnership with the Soviet Union. It's a joint project. Excuse me, did you yes. say mind control? Mind control, yes. M-I-N-D? M-I-N-D, <laughs> yes. And mind control uh, is a component of HARP. When World War II was over, there's a whole history of it. Our soldiers came back, and also from the Korean War, and the U.S. government wanted to know they were zombies when they came back. And the U.S. government, the military, the intelligence agencies, the OSS that, that became in 1947 the CIA, they said they must be, uh, the Asians must have some kind of mind control um, ability and, and we want that so we can use it. That was the main reason for starting the CIA and the MK Ultra project. Project Artichoke, Project Bluebird, um, there were many projects and uh, they wanted to make Manchurian candidates. Lee Harvey Oswald was a Manchurian candidate. I interviewed a, a Project Artichoke a victim who was kidnapped when he was eight years old from uh, the East Bay of San Francisco and his mother sold him into uh, Project Artichoke and he was taken to the safe house. I interviewed him for five days. He asked me if I would help him write a book and I said, yes, I will, but uh, I have to see your evidence and documentation first. He was totally solid. And the last thing he handed me was a photo of this old farmhouse out in the country and it had a big pole with a, um, um, I've forgotten what you call it, uh, high energy electricity on the top of the pole right next to the the building this farmhouse and I said what's this he said well this is the safe house where they tortured me and they murdered children and and um, raped them and uh, did these experiments and I said well where's the safe house he said it's in Livermore and then I knew that Livermore was the main contractor on HARP and the main partner with the Soviet Union. So I started digging through the internet and Googling Livermore and Woodpecker and, and, and I finally found it an, an awards newsletter for the Livermore Lab, which they publish once a year to brag about all their discoveries, popped up 1993 or 94 and it said 16 scientists have gone to Washington DC to receive the highest NSA and CIA award for their project, their work on the Woodpecker Project. And we can't say what the Woodpecker Project is about because it's top secret, but it's a way to get information there's no other way to get. So then I started Googling the key scientists in World War II and after who were involved in these projects. Vannevar Bush, who was the head of the science initiative in World War II, Edward Teller, um, uh, people like that. And they were all Rockefeller contractors. Uh, uh, Robert Oppenheimer actually was a Rothschild contractor, the international bankers. Then I began to realize and understand that the weapons of mass destruction are for the bankers. 
and I'd like to read a short paragraph written by Richard Cook. The article, he's worked at many different uh, jobs in the U.S. government, so he really has a good overview. And he wrote this article, Extraordinary Times, Intentional Collapse and Takedown of the USA. And he wrote this in September 2008, and it's on Michelle Shostodovsky's website in Canada, globalresearch.ca. This is what Richard Cook said. Quote, as the 20th century advanced, the financier elite became heavily involved in getting rich off World War and the manufacture of the new weapons of mass destruction that modern technology made possible. Warfare and weaponry combined with control of credit manufactured through the leveraging of industrial production were to be the primary methods of putting nations and their populations into debt. A materialistic slave society was being created, which books like 1984 warned against. Humanity was lured into compliance through the fantasy world brought about by the mass media by means of advertising, cinema, and television. Another enticement was the growing availability of mass-produced consumer goods. And so you see, these weapons of mass destruction are used to carry out these false flag projects. And the ones who benefit are really the international financiers. Because what they're trying to do is carry out terrorist events that frighten the public and the citizens into uh, compliance with the, um, the goals and the control that the bankers want to have over ordinary people. Now, what did 9-11 uh, accomplish? Number one, it it introduced the police state through the Patriot Act. Nobody in Congress was allowed to read it. They were locked in a room. Three members of Congress have told me that. And they were told nobody's leaving Congress until every member of the Senate and the House sign it. It was signed by the next morning. Number two, um, the, um, the Patriot Act. Oh, uh, the military got the Northern Command, which is a new domestic branch of the federal military with headquarters in Colorado. And this violates the Posse Comitatus Act of 1867 or, six, is it 67? Something like that. And this forbids, it prohibits uh, the U.S. military from being able to enforce laws in the United States against U.S. citizens. Well, what's happening now? They've sent our whole National Guard, who are the, the emergency responders in our states, to Afghanistan and Iraq and turned them into uranium meat. They're coming back. They're so sick, they can't do anything. They can't even advocate for themselves for health care. And, um, and now Bush has been bringing the military back into each state. So we have no, the governors and the legislatures don't have a National Guard to use uh, to protect the citizens against our own military. The third goal was to establish a military presence in Central Asia. This is the heart of the oil. Uh, that we would like to gain control of. And um, the attack on the World Trade Center was blamed, of course, on the Afghanis. They had nothing to do with it. Now, when you listen to what some very, very, very sophisticated world leaders have said, one of them is General Ivashov of Russia. Soviet, uh, let's see, was it the Soviet Union? No, it was Russia in 2001. Now, he had satellite information. He had information on the ground from their spies in the United States. 
he had the mainstream media evidence. Um, he had a lot of information, but more importantly, he had an awful lot of military experience in Russia and the countries they operate in. And he's an older man, so he had the Soviet Union experience too. And what he said is, it's a great article, you should Google it and read it. He said, international terrorism does not exist. And he said, first of all, all terrorists are funded by intelligence agencies. It's the only way they can get money. Yeah. And cross borders. Yes, and cross borders. He said the Pentagon is the most well-protected building in the world. It's impossible to attack it. It's the military that did it. And he said um, in order to bring about world change, the New World Order was unhappy with the pace that change was happening at. It wasn't fast enough. So they wanted a false flag event to accelerate the change and the goals of the New World Order. And they were certainly involved in it. But he said it was the politicians and the military that carried this out. Uh, could you repeat about the terrorists, who they're funded by? Okay. General Ivashov, who was the chief of staff of the entire Russian military at the time of 9-11 of in 2001, uh, he said that um, international terrorism by independent groups does not exist, by rogue groups. He said that terrorists are funded and controlled by intelligence agencies. He also said that intelligence agencies work together from other countries. And actually he said that, um, he said usually it's politicians and the military that carry out terrorist events. But in this case, it was um, politicians and the oligarchy, oligarchs, or the ruling elite like Cheney, Bush, the Bushes, um, Cheney's family um, started Skull and Bones. He, through his mother, he's related to the Taft family. That's part of the, that's one of the 300 ruling families in the United States. And um, there, there were others involved too. Um, but he said it's impossible for terrorist organizations to gather the money, uh, carry these very sophisticated terrorist events out uh, in other countries to get into a country that's so well protected like the United States and then to attack a building like the Pentagon that is, that is um, just, I mean, how could anyone get around the military and attack the most protected building in the world? So um, the, the military was certainly involved and they certainly benefited with the establishment of bases in Central Asia which expands their budget their presence, their power, and also the Patriot Act um, and, um, and the Northern Command, which essentially turns them into um, our jail keepers. So <clears throat> going back, oh, then the former um, president of Italy, I've forgotten his name, it starts with a C, uh, he, yes, Cosigo? Francisco Cosiga Francisco actually set up Gladio in Europe after World War II. Gladio is the leave behind army that was left in Europe to control um, the countries and the governments in Europe and the people, the citizens, after World War II was over. We had to bring all our soldiers back, you know, the war was over, the occupation was over, but we didn't want to lose the control that that military presence had given us, so we left a secret army behind that didn't wear uniforms and that maybe spoke Italian in Italy and spoke French in France and spoke Swiss French in Switzerland, and they uh, controlled and funded the Red Brigades and uh, other terrorist groups and 
the leaders in those groups did uh, most of them didn't even know they were being controlled by the intelligence agencies so um, then uh, <laughs> Castro of Cuba very recently said 9-11 uh, was an inside job of course that's so obvious and he said, he has nothing to lose. He has nothing to lose, right? <laughs> and he had a very amusing way of saying it. So <clears throat> here are world leaders now and a member of the Japanese parliament speaking out. So, um, I mean, we can't really believe that Arabs with box cutters, we can't ignore the experience and the insight and the wisdom and the intelligence that um, information that these people have. We, we have to really consider that they know what they're talking about because they've done it in their own countries and to other countries and the intelligence agencies all work for each other and with each other and the British, is it MI6 or M16? MI6. MI6 trained the Mossad and trained the CIA. So the Mossad and the CIA work for MI6. And MI6 and the CIA and the Mossad work for the City of London bankers. The FBI is the private intelligence agency for the Federal Reserve, and the CIA is the private intelligence agency for the City of London bankers. Um, so going back to the World Trade Center and the weapon of ma weapons of mass destruction. Now when I saw those uh, perfectly geometrically round circles and they exactly touched each other throughout the footprint of both, both World Trade Center buildings, I said, oh, I've seen this before. I've seen a demonstration of this beam. I lived in Livermore after I became a whistleblower and I would have um, a student or an intern at Livermore rent a room for me every summer so that my daughter could meet different kinds of people. So I had a Navajo girl one summer, I had um, a black physicist, a very nice looking, very personable guy uh, who was working in the laser center that, that summer and the laser project is called Shiva, the dance of the universe. It's the molecules and the atoms, the energy of the universe dancing. That's what Shiva represents. And <clears throat> he came in and he woke me up, knocked on my room, uh, my bedroom door, and woke me up in the middle of the night one night. He said, come outside, come outside, come outside, I want you to see something. So I went outside in my bathrobe and I looked up right in front of the lab there was a huge amber laser beam 16 feet in diameter pointing straight up into the sky. And he said they diverted air traffic for five miles, a five mile radius all around that beam because, you know, it would destroy the plane. And um, I said, well, 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 what are they doing with that? What's that for? He said it's an experiment. I said, well, what are they doing with it? What are they trying to do with it? And he said, oh, they're trying to make a star. And, you know, I knew that was bullshit <laughs> because you leave, use lasers to destroy things, to molecularly dissociate, to break the bonds and make smaller and smaller particles. And lasers have very complex waveforms. They're made out of all kinds of things. They're ruby lasers and diamond lasers and every kind of laser. And um, they tried them all at Livermore because I knew this guy who collected them out of garbage cans when they got thrown away in the laboratories. <laughs> and he had this room in his house, a whole bedroom full of um, shelves, and he had every laser that, <laughs> that he collected out of the garbage cans at Livermore. He said, come on, I'll demonstrate them. <laughs> so he, he was shooting them at trees in his backyard, and it was, I went, oh my God, what a freak show. <laughs> well, um, these guys are like kids in candy stores. These are just big toys, and they're just big boys who are really little boys playing with lethal weapons. The ethical dimension escapes them entirely. They have no ethics. They have no concept of the applications. They don't even care. They're just so excited that they can make this toy work. 
I am serious. That's exactly how they are. They are the most immature men I've ever met in my life. They can't even put socks on two feet every morning that are the same color. Their wives have to do it for them. So, um, so I was looking at this, this amber beam going straight up into the heavens, and I said, uh, oh, this is a beam weapon. This is a beam weapon. And since then, a friend who was formerly in naval intelligence told me they are using these beam weapons, NASA and the military, to blow up um, asteroids and um, comets. And uh, they're just shooting this stuff up there like, uh, you know, little boys. Game. Yeah, like, like a video game, exactly. But these are extremely, extremely dangerous weapons. And the Hadron Collider at CERN in Switzerland, I believe it's in Switzerland, they are experimenting with a technology that can turn the Earth into a black hole. They're very dangerous. This can destroy all of us, all of life on this planet, and we don't even know what they're doing. So. These weapons exist. I saw the demonstration. Um, I saw the evidence at the World Trade Center. Uh, they didn't have any uh, plows out there making circles in the uh, footprints of the, the World Trade Center buildings. There, um, that's some other very exotic technology. And where are the buildings? Where's all the building material that should be 35 stories high in those footprints? Now, Judy Wood, I think she has done the most critical, the key research that needs to be addressed on what happened at the World Trade Center. And when we know what happened at the World Trade Center and the technologies that, that, that were used, that leads us to the agencies that were involved and who had the weapons that made that possible. And I'm telling you right now, it's NASA. This is harp, 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 harp. And what they did was they used explosives in the buildings to break down the structure of the buildings, the steel beams, and, and those were very, very well-built, very robust buildings. They were designed by a Japanese architect, and they were built like pipes, steel pipes. And no plane could fly into those, I'm telling you right now. The front of a plane, it's an instrument package with a skin of aluminum over it, and it's like flying an eggshell into a building. <laughs> so um, the, um, the particles, I mean, Judy Wood's presentation was so good. It was so profoundly... Uh, eye-opening that she did at Madison that I've been really working on it ever since. And I tried to do some radio interviews to get her information out because she's so blacklisted now. And I was in the middle of an interview um, and I was just starting on the harp and beam weapons and Judy Wood's work. As soon as I said Judy Wood, this is in November, all the electricity went off in my house my phone was cut, and I had to go outside in my bathrobe and uh, uh, hit the breaker switch, go back in, try to get back on the phone, get my phone working. That took out half an hour. And, um, and so Judy, um, Sophia said, I would like to redo this interview. And I said, OK. But when we redo it, I'm not going to mention Judy Wood because as soon as I say her name, all the electricity goes off. And the whole point is getting her information out. And, um, and so we redid it. And I said, please don't interrupt me until I get the information out. And it's my comments and my perspective from what I know from my specialty to add to and support what her observations were, and I was able to get that out, but now I'm getting slammed on the internet by Andrew Johnson, who um, 
is attacking me and the radio host who interviewed me, Alfred Weber, for stealing Judy Wood's information and not giving her credit. And um, that wasn't my intent at all. It gets twisted around. And what they're really afraid of is my naming and involvement of HARP with 9-11 at the World Trade Center. Now, we had a phone call from the astronaut Edgar Mitchell, who wrote the first letter of support for my Berkeley resolution banning weapons in space. That resolution was taken to uh, cities in Canada, adopted it. Citizens gathered thousands of signatures because um, Prime, Minister Harp, uh, Prime Minister Paul Martin in Canada had made a secret agreement with Bush to implement national missile defense and Canadians didn't want it. So they used my resolution to gather signatures. They marched into the parliament and they forced Paul Martin to reverse his secret agreement with Bush. I said, well, he'll, he'll, he's out of office now. Six months later, he was out and Harper was in. Wow. So you never know what tiny effort you do, what, what how that will be used, who will use it, what the results are, it doesn't matter. It just matters that you do something. And believe me, it's a lot better than being depressed because you're doing nothing. Amen. <laughs> yeah. I, I never plan anything. I just, um, I just go with um, the intuition or just sort of like today, it was just a day that happened. And sometimes the universe just guides you. In fact, it always does. And the universe, when you trust it, it provides what you need. So today, it provided the contacts and the depleted uranium bills and the research librarian we needed to find them and the secretaries in the legislature to tell us how to do this and contact these people and find these people. And that's just how the universe works. And that's how we should let it work because it leaves you with this incredible lightness of being and all your control issues just completely disappear. They really do. Your anxiety. Yeah. Don't you think I had control issues? Ten schools in 12 years? Military. Yeah, military. Sure, because my whole life was out of control all the time. That's why I went to the woods. Because I felt safe there in nature. But now, I feel safe with people. And I get lots of hugs and kisses. <laughs> <laughs> and love and special car rides and, and cafe lattes and, and intimate moments with really dear new friends. And I get to meet all kinds of people. And uh, last night I stayed up with Tim's uh, really wonderful daughter. and. Um, his wife is Japanese, and so we talked all about Japan and all the fun things we did there and the food and the tea, and it was really, really fun. And so everywhere I go now, I felt so isolated all of my life, and now I feel so connected. <clears throat> and I see all these smiles, and people just come. People just come. They're just, they come and help me and we help each other. And that's really what it's all about. It's about all of us being connected to each other. That's what humanity's about. You also speak from your heart, so that's yeah. the <laughs> Yeah, but I had to find my heart. And I found my heart through this terribly important issue to humanity and all living things. I had to really surrender everything and give up myself to work on this radiation issue. And the radiation issue is a big part of 9-11. You can't separate the issues. The bankers, the weapons of mass destruction, the genocide and extermination of third world people to steal their mineral resources, the extermination of us with GMO, with depleted uranium, with vaccines, with uh, food that isn't even nutritious. We're we're, um, uh, we're being genocided too. And I don't think that we need to allow that to happen. Silence 
is the sanction of the victim. And going through all this pain, losing my daughter, being bankrupted, being hounded and harassed like Karen Silkwood was, tra people trying to drive me off the road in the middle of the night. Um, this is all this pain where you die. But there's some kind of will in the bottom of you that you find. And you rise like a phoenix from the ashes. And then you die again. And you rise from the fe the, like a phoenix from the ashes again until you've lost everything, including all of your fear. And then you're at a spiritual level. You're inspired and you're energized by your spiritual power. And then humanity just comes and helps you. And you go and help them and, and it, you're not afraid anymore. And that's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing this, to find ourselves and to find each other. And in that process, we'll find the answer to all of the questions that ha we have. Yeah. I was going to go back to the science. Go ahead. Uh, Get me back on track. I wanted to raise this when you were talking about Judy and her. Uh huh. Um, the level five hurricane that she pictures mm -hmm. on her website. Could you connect that with what you know about heart? I've never read anything of Judy's. I've never seen her website. I don't know anything about the hurricane, but people have talked about it. And I only saw that pres presentation in Madison. So could you tell me about Aaron, and then maybe I could make a, a comment? Well, there's a satellite image. He has on our website, it's very clear that there was a huge hurricane right off the coast on 9-11 of New York City. Referred to- A vortex. Uh -huh. A vortex. Yes. A, cl a classic hurricane with an eye. Yeah. 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 It's called a vortex. Yes. Yeah. 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 And the explanation on the media was that it was a small tropical storm. <laughs> uh huh. She gives you that also on her, you know, um, from the radio report. So you have both the satellite image to look at as well as how it was being reported. Okay, let's go back. Okay, are you through? Yeah. Okay. So what we do is we go back to the science. I'm a geoscientist. All hurricanes originate in North Africa. And they come across the Pacific and they slam into the Caribbean. And then they also go up, they hang around down there, and then they go up the East Coast. So what we want to do is to go back to the history, the tracking history of Aaron, and see if it did develop in North Africa, if it did have a no normal pattern traveling across the Atlantic and up the, the East Coast. Now, I remember before Hurricane Katrina, like two years before Hurricane Katrina, there were, um, there were um, diagrams and probably aerial photos of hurricanes on the internet. And there were f at least five hurricanes that came across the Atlantic, but they were wandering up and around and going in circles like drunken sailors. That is not a normal pattern. So that was the military, or whoever operates HARP, NASA, um, practicing steering hurricanes. And the way they steer hurricanes, and I uh, found a photo on the NASA website of Hurricane Katrina with a beam going straight down into one side of Hurricane Katrina. That's how they stir them. This is an energy beam from space, from HARP, or from satellites, or what other secret technologies they have up there. And the energy in the beam ionizes the moisture in the air and makes it look like fog so that you can see this foggy white beam going down into Katrina. And they ionize one side of the hurricane. They put energy into it, and they're able to steer it that way. To increase the energy in a hurricane, it's a vortex, which means 
tornadoes or vortexes, hurricanes or vortexes, um, processes in space are vortexes. It's energy swirling around. Um, there's high energy and low energy, or there's heat and cold, and they want to mix to become the same temperature or the same energy. And, um, and so they swirl like that until they're all mixed. And to make that energy increase, they drag the hurricane over warm ocean water and the heat in the water uh, wants to go up and mix with the colder air in the hurricane. So it increases the energy, the destructive potential of the hurricane. Um, tornadoes are like that. Uh, it's just hot and cold wanting to mix. Now you can do that experiment with a bottle. And what you do is you get a bottle of water and you put dye in it, food coloring. You put a piece of paper on it and you put hot water in another bottle just like this and you put the paper on it and turn it over and put it on top of the other bottle. So you have cold water with coloring in it and hot water with no coloring in it and the paper here. You pull the paper out and you watch the vortex, the mixing happening until it's all the same shade of that one color which means that the hot and cold have completely mixed. So that's basically what hurricanes and tornadoes are about. And so what the military, the Navy, NASA has learned to do, the intelligence agencies, is to weaponize energy. They're weaponizing hurricanes. They're weaponizing tornadoes. They're weaponizing earthquakes. This is what HARP is being used for. And they use those weapons to vaporize the World Trade Center buildings because no chemical explosives can powder those buildings, divide them into, break the bonds into particles that are the size of nanoparticles or even atoms. And Judy Wood had these photos from, of, of the, the smoke or the particles drifting up into the upper atmosphere within a day. How could that happen? That's a process I've never observed on this earth or planet ever. So what is the technology that made that possible? It's not any technology that we know about in the uh, open media, in the open literature, because it's all classified. But I started doing radio interviews. I've done eight one-hour radio interviews on co-op radio. I have them here with me. and. Um, they started going all over the world and that's when Edgar Mitchell called and said, get her off the radio and don't post those interviews on your website and um, or I'll resign from your organization and, um, and then NATO and NASA and the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy all started um, going after me in these interviews. So. I must be onto something. <laughs> now what's really interesting is none of this is classified. This is all in the open literature, but it's all compartmentalized. So it's a little article in the Wall Street Journal, it's a little article in Time, it's a little article here, it's a little article there. And I just kept collecting this stuff and I started building the case. So I did an interview on the radio about the Kashmir earthquake of 2005 in Kashmir and in, in India, Pakistan. It was a huge earthquake and it, was, it happened just when the winter snows were starting in the Himalayas. 70 million people were killed just in Kashmir alone. More were killed in Pakistan and more were killed in India. But guess what? All the roads were ruined. It, they were all muddy in the Himalayas. No uh, rescue agencies could get in there. And it left 3.3 million people homeless in the Himalayas in the winter snows. So how many more people died? That killed more than the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so they're using earthquakes in highly populated locations to depopulate. 
That's what the atomic bombs are for. That's what the depleted uranium is for. It's all for depopulation. The China earthquake. The China earthquake. Um, what I noticed that in countries we don't like that were hosting uh, the Olympics, that there was some kind of a natural disaster in many of those countries that happened a week or two before the Olympics that gobbled up millions of dollars or billions of dollars in funds that were needed to finish the Olympic preparation. So it puts the whole government and the whole country in chaos just before this uh, window uh, dressing uh, performance of the Olympics in these countries. Another thing that they're doing is rogue waves. All of a sudden, in 1995, which is when they turned harp on, rogue waves, these 100-foot waves, were being reported in the ocean. 250 world-class ocean cargo ships have disappeared in the last 20 years. 250. And these are rogue waves that are 100 feet high. No ship in the world is constructed to withstand a 100-foot wave. Now, how come they started, it just started, you know, when they, with HARP, when HARP was turned on. Um, they're bankrupting banks. The Kobe earthquake bankrupted, um, I've forgotten the name, Bearings Bank, which is the Queen's Bank. The royal family has owned part of it since the 1700s. The Kobe earthquake bankrupted her bank. And so what they're using is HARP. These are the international financiers, the Wall Street and City of London bankers, to eliminate competitors. And so if, if ships, cargo ships are disappearing, they must be eliminating uh, transportation competitors, oil cargo ship competitors. Insurance. Yeah. And um, so HARP is being, it has many applications. Um, and bankrupting the country. And bankrupting countries, that's right. Trillionaires are About fighting the, Al the billionaires. Yes. What? About the Al Iran earthquake, but exactly a year later, the tsunami earthquake, on the unboxing day. Yeah, exactly. Exactly it's exactly, yeah. And so there's a whole list of these uh, earthquakes that I found the economic uh, the, en the en economic benefactors to these different staged. And another thing, another element of HARP is the foreshadowing. They always foreshadow these events. The day before 9-11, on September 10th, 2001, FEMA announced, predicted, there would be a terrorist event in New York City. It happened the next day. There would be a hurricane disaster in, in New Orleans. That was Katrina three years later. That was a land grab. And there would be an earthquake disaster off of the West Coast. So guess what? We're next. And they're practicing tsunami disasters in Southern California and earthquake disasters. And there's a little volcano growing from the seafloor off the coast of Oregon. Just like the volcanoes in, in Hawaii. They start on the seafloor and they grow and grow and grow. Um, Mauna, Mauna Loa is the highest mountain in the world. If you measured it from the top all the way to the bottom of the seafloor where the bottom of it is. So, um, so it's pretty obvious to me that the property owners in Tribeca, which is um, near the World Trade Center, have benefited from 9-11. Christy Todd Whitman, who um, was the head of the EPA, is a Rockefeller contractor. She's always worked for the Rockefellers. And her husband works for the insurance company that held the insurance portfolio for the World Trade Center. And Christy Todd Whitman and her husband had investments that actually the World Trade Center made money for them. The World Trade Center d disaster. 
made money for them. Um, the EPA, um, she did the cover up at the EPA on the particle size and the toxicity in the air and the air pollution and she had to do that so that the property owners didn't lose money from the health, the negative health effects of the World Trade Center on New York City. Why did Bush get rid of her? Oh, because she did her job. She got promoted. <laughs> she did her job to cover up 9-11 in New York City. And so he didn't get rid of her, he promoted her. She went on to a better job. It just looks like he fired her. But they don't fire each other, they promote each other. It's, it's, a, it's a reward system that we don't understand because they're rewarding failure, not success. <laughs> no. Right? Yeah. So, um, there's, there's a lot to do research on at the World Trade Center and the energy needed to make those two buildings disappear is the key to understanding what happened. And chemical explosives do not release enough energy. Another thing is that um, Judy Wood showed uh, videos of the, the ash coming down or the dust coming down and then it just sort of slowed down and just started going up into the air. That's that, that violates the, um, the laws of gravity. So what was happening is probably the beam energy was dividing those particles into smaller and smaller sizes so that they, they began to drift away. They were carried away in the air, the air movement in the air masses. But how they got up into uh, upper, the upper atmosphere so fast is really puzzling. So um, I'd like to um, stop now and take some questions. I'm sure that people have questions and they'd like to discuss. Yes. Her first and you next. Just on the local issue, yes. did you by any chance get to see that you play your uranium bill down at the Capitol? And did you That's what we did today. We did, went to the did, Capitol. Yeah, did you read the bill? Did you? We got all of them. And we were in the chamber when they read the new one. It's actually a, is it's a. Uh, you have a copy of it here? Yeah. Um, it's uh, the uh, veterans group uh, requested that this. I think it's called a memorial, a memoriam bill, and uh, it has to go to Congress. Congress isn't going to do anything, but the um, the people who worked on the bill or whoever the veterans went to is confidential. That information is not released in this particular uh, memorial, memoriam, Memorand it's a memorandum or a memoriam, yeah. So um, we'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you about, about it tomorrow and, and we can make copies for you. Uh, so you had a question. Yeah, more of a spiritual thing. Do you yes. feel that people who carried it out, carried it out also as like a human sacrifice? Kind of oh, absolutely. It's a psychic trauma to the American public they do it every 20 years. It's a world war. It's a terrorist event. It's, it's a depression. It happens every 20 years. And I figured this out when I was teaching my daughter her genealogy. And I put five generations of her ancestors from my family and her father's family on the wall. And I explained the emotional history of each generation, the choices they've made, the consequences to their lives. And I started realizing every generation was tied to some major event in the United States or a world event. I said, how come it's every 20 years? Because it's engineered. <laughs> That's why. Do they get something from that sacrifice? Like well, the, the World Trade Center buildings represented the American empire. They were the tallest buildings in the United States. Or were they the tallest in the world? Maybe Dubai now. For a period of time. For a period of time. And so they represent the, um, the might, the military strength, the esteem, the strength of the dollar, 
the um, superiority of the U.S., the hubris of its shadow government and leaders, all kinds of things. And so, um, you know, what do you do when you want to destroy someone? Well, for a woman, you scratch her face or you ruin her face. You damage her self-esteem. Um, for a man, you take his job away or you wreck his car or his favorite truck or... Um, husbands and wives, when they split up, do this to each other all the time. They destroy something that other per that other person loves. So um, that's what that's what they did. That's what the World Trade Center buildings represented. But at the same time, I mean, it's always done for multiple purposes. At the same time, the World Trade Center buildings were full of asbestos. They were ready to be pulled down. They were obsolete, and um, the, um, they had been ordered, the Port Authority had been ordered to take the buildings down three stories at a time. They couldn't do a controlled demolition. And so a contract, that they were put up for contract for lease and Silverstein leased them and whoever leases them from the Port Authority, they can destroy them. But the Port Authority, the owner, cannot. And um, so there, it's really good to go out and study laws and, and uh, uh, codes, building codes and everything because you start to understand other things about uh, what hidden agendas or who's benefiting or what the multiple purposes are. It's never just for one thing. Yes? Um, for those who are interested, you might want to explain, you know, DU is such a, an effective anti-tank weapon and that why it would be the perfect weapon of choice under the Pentagon. Oh, yeah. Because of plasmas and aerosols and... Yeah. The energy, the kinetic energy. Right. And it's so dense. That's right. And even the kinetic energy, kinetic energy um, is the energy for instance, that goes into building the World Trade Center buildings. All the energy, the, the gallons of gasoline or diesel or the electricity that went into lifting all those building materials up 110 stories. Now when a building collapses, all of that energy is released. But it's not enough energy to completely powder those buildings. What happened to that energy? It's not on the seismic record. When those buildings came down, there should have been a big earthquake signal or uh, an, an earth movement signal on the seismic record that reflects that amount of energy released. It's not there. Mm -hmm. So where is that? Energy doesn't just disappear. It, there's something called conservation of energy. It doesn't just flake out. It's somewhere. Um, the, uh, there, there are many anomalies when you really look at the science of uh, these buildings and the destruction of the buildings there are an awful lot of questions and anomalies and mysteries and they're just plain violations of the laws of science so you have to find an explanation for it and what they're doing is um, bringing uh, disinformation people into the 9-11 movement like all the other movements and they confuse people who are not scientists because they don't have the scientific background to know what is possible scientifically and what is not. Did I answer your question? Well, not specifically, but it was a good answer. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, okay. You, I'll, I'll you, say, you know, do you want to go for it, it, because it wiped out the tanks. No, it wiped out our military. Well, eventually, but it also... It didn't win out. any war. It, it, it's very effective as an anti-tank weapon. Tungsten works, works too. Tungsten works mm -hmm. too, but do you... Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah, but we killed... We have a million well, soldiers medically saying, disabled. No, it was a horrible thing. What I'm saying yeah. is, uh, on, on the surface, it won... It it's it, a very, it very effective we weapon. Right. So it would have been the weapon of choice for the Pentagon because it could go through those five thick walls. That's right, but it contaminated the Pentagon. Yeah, I don't know. And all of Washington, D.C. That must have been a huge cleanup. 
They didn't clean it up. Wow. Hmm. So you can go there with a Geiger counter now? Yeah. You can go take bark off of trees. You can co go and take leaves off of trees. Uh, you can take soil samples, and it's radioactive. Hmm. In, in, in a typical oh, oh, just a minute. Barry's next. Yeah. What evidence, you know, with uh, radiation could there have been before they started hauling all the stuff away from the buildings? Well, all the crash site rubble was radioactive. So you're hauling away all the dirt around it and everything. Mm -hmm. to get rid of that. So, but that radiation, there's been some controversy in our meetings about um, whether or not, for example, when we talk about fourth generation micronutrients that Deagle talked about being uh -huh. used in the building, would there have been a residue of Yeah, of and nuclear? yeah, and there was tritium. Tritium was detected at the World Trade Center. Right. I heard somebody say deuterium, but I haven't seen the written, documented source for that. Um, and there was a lot of uranium there in the air monitoring data. Now, tritium and deuterium are used in nuclear weapons. Tritium is also in exit signs where you can't plug them into an electrical source. They put a curie of tritium in tubes and that lights up the exit sign. But Willie Rodriguez and other sources have said there were no tritium exit signs in the World Trade Center building. So where'd that tritium come from? Which way do you think? The, uh, the thing that we know, I don't know about the impact in the basement, we see beams going across uh, from the South Tower to the 15th floor of the Deutsche Bank building, and by the by the uh, a bank a World Trade Center number one going across West Highway and into the 17th floor of the American Express building. Now, where did that energy? It, it seems to have come from the basement. Right. These are 20 ton. Yeah, these are 20 ton. Yes. These are the external. Yes. Uh, and Willie what Rodriguez? Willie Rodriguez said there were explosions in the basement. And he rescued co-workers, other janitors, who were bleeding and injured, and he carried them out of the basement. Well, what was the energy that forced, these are 50 ton feet, two of them into the Deutsches Bank building, two of them into, what was the energy force, where did that come from? And Daigle says it was a mini nuke in the basement. What, what do you say? That's what Doug Rocky said. When he saw Judy Wood's presentation, he said they use mini nukes. So we're really talking about um, maybe perhaps redundant energies that took this building down. You've already oh, it's layers, it's layers of energies, it's multiple technologies, it's in integrated, and integrated in a very sophisticated way, very very calculated, very carefully planned. It took a very sophisticated plan to do this. This wasn't just a controlled demolition. Nope. And another thing is, Judy Wood had photos of, I think it was the Seattle Dome when they did a controlled demolition on it, and the dust pile didn't go any higher than the height of the building. Mm -hmm. So how in the world did we have dust from the World Trade Centers going into the upper atmosphere? Okay. Yeah. Um, most did you have a, oh, you have a question? You answered it. I okay. was going to ask about trivia. Okay. Um, you know, like if I went out of here to this building and I try to explain what you said to somebody, they'd think I was a total idiot, you know? You don't need to. Just show them the DVD. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> They can then, they can argue with me. Anyway, a question I had was, you know, most of the people we know are, you know, at least half sane. <laughs> And, uh, this isn't about being insane or sane. We're no. all sane. Yeah, I know that, but yeah, we're sane. In other words, we have a little bit of morality. We we kind of stop being their victim. Know the difference between right and wrong. They do you, don't. Uh, do you have any? I mean, how how would you explain how how could people possibly be this evil? Yeah, this evil. Easy. They're evil people. Yeah. And so what you're doing here 
is you're trying to take logic and make sense out of what is illogical because it's insanity. And you can't do that. You have to be who you are, we have to be what we are, and you have to objectively look at what you see there, what happened there that's documented, and the scientific principles that explain that. It doesn't have anything to do with them being insane or you being sane. You know, it's, it's so hard to understand. How can there be so many of these totally evil and wicked people who are extremely intelligent? They're you not know? intelligent. They're extremely greedy. They're stupid. I know, but look at how smart these people are with the use of all this technology, this very high technology to do all this. Stuff. That's our technology that they've misapplied and used against us. We paid for all the scientific research, and the scientists, who are really a bunch of prostitutes and whores for corporations and the government, are the evil ones who made it possible. It's the scientists. None of the, those stupid people who are the greedy ones who are behind this, they couldn't do that. They're not smart enough. But they're, pay, they're paying these... Uh... No, we're paying the, the scientists. We're building those weapons. It's our tax money. Right. It's our labor. It's our intelligence. It's our children. It's our future. That's what they're destroying. And so we're the dumb ones if we continue to let them do it. And the only way we can stop them is to understand the whole dynamic, the vested interests, who benefits, how are they doing it, how are we complicit by allowing it to happen, and why do we believe the media when we know they're lying. It's not about are we crazy or because they're saying we're crazy because we're talking about conspiracies that are really happening or are they really crazy and we know they're crazy and we're sane so what happened and what are we going to do about it to stop it that's what it's about okay what's our and strategy the world turns on information i don't know i just give information to the universe it comes down and people pick it up and they find ways to use it. I don't have any expectations. I don't care if anybody believes me or not, but I know the science that I've put out on the internet all over the world has made a difference. Yes? About the information, yes? Sir. Yes. I went to the site you had on your uh, cards. Yeah. It's a different site. Oh, no, it's the Association for Women Geoscientists. Exactly. No, no, you have to Google my name. Okay. Loren. All right. And then it's all over the internet. There are all kinds of articles. Go to Google Video. There are all kinds of videos and interviews. Fantastic. My 9-11 um, yeah. speech in Tokyo and, and Will, William Rodriguez, it's okay. all on the internet, on Google Video. All right. So that's one part. The other part is like some things like the hard uh -huh. thing. For a lot of people, even the concept that, okay, the weather is being controlled. Yeah, earthquake is okay. Being controlled, right. Shock for a lot of right. People. Right. It was a big shock for me, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the only shocked one. No, no, I remember the first time I heard this. I said, like, oh my God, this is hard. There must still be random acts of <laughs> Yeah, this is this is really crazy, I know. Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 You know, So, um, I just started going, oh, what is this harp for? It's taken me five years. Yeah. And it's just sifting through things and collecting things and then putting things together and what they're using harp for and the satellites. They're using it for mineral exploration. They can use radio tomography, which is electromagnetic frequencies, to, Bechtel is doing this all over the world. They can point them down to the earth and they get a radio frequency back and they know exactly what mineral is, it's, is there. Is it gold? Is there an oil deposit? Is there natural gas? 
guess what they found offshore from Gaza in the year 2000? Yes. Natural gas. Countries usually get 66% of the mineral deposit and the companies or corporations that come in and develop it and mine it or whatever, they get the rest. Israel is offering the Palestinians 10%, um, but it, none of it's cash. They get services from Israel. Another wall? Yeah. Or more bulldozers in their olive orchards. Yeah. And so the rule for these international financiers, and Israel represents the international financiers, the rule for the colonized or the conquered people, this is the, the Native Americans in the United States, the um, First Nation people in Canada, the Palestinians in Palestine, the rule is always that the conquered people or the colonized people should never benefit from colonization. And then they're targeted for extermination. Just a little aside, there yes. were Brexit, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago among the conquerors and the conquered, the common people starved among the, well, I'm not getting right, among the conquerors and the conquered, the common people starved among the con conquered and, uh, it gets reversed anyway, but the common people starved regardless. I'm yeah. That's right. They start, they start 17 our history has always been this. It's just that we 17 million ethnic Christian Russians were starved to death in 1932 to 33 by the Bolsheviks. A Russian was investigating that and he started looking at the US depression. Between 1932 and 33, 6 million mostly American wealthy American well-to-do American farmers were starved to death deliberately by the US government. And the person who engineered that is the one in World War II who confiscated all of the Japanese American land, and they were mostly farmers, put them in concentration camps, stole all their land. It was the same guy. It's all land grabs. Railroad land grabs. Stalin wanted uh, to have communes and he wanted to take back the land from people who had supported the Russian Revolution. He had to give the farmers something to get them to help win, win the revolution. So then he wanted to take the land back. He didn't want their children to have it. He wanted communes. So he starved to death. The Bolsheviks starved 17 million Russian, mostly farmers. We're doing it again right now. We're doing it in other countries. The Chinese are exporting farmers to different countries. Korea has now leased uh, millions of acres of Madagascar farmland, and they're going to do, they're going to grow f food in Madagascar. Well, they need farmers to do it, so they're going to send Chinese farmers to Madagascar to grow food for Korea. It's a global land grab, it's a total scam. But they've been doing this. In it's small on a smaller scale, all all for centuries. Yes, he has to change the tape. Okay. Bring the question over here. I forgot who asked it. Okay, so you're next. Uh, you said that the research, uh, the information that you've been getting out, has been doing some good. And well, let me put it this way. I called up Alfred Weber, who did these harp interviews with me on co-op radio in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I said, hey Alfred, guess how many Google hits we have on the harp interviews? He said, oh, maybe 130. I said, no, it's about 35,000. And he jumped on the computer. He said, oh my god, it, Himalayas, Kazakhstan. Uh, Georgia, uh, Europe, oh my god, these interviews are all over the place. We have to do some more. <laughs> so. so people are very, very hungry for information and there's almost no one talking about HARP. Yeah. Okay, basically my question is, do you think if somehow we can disseminate enough information, if we can get enough people educated, there's a chance we can stop all this evil? You're having expectations, so you're setting yourself up for deep disappointment. 
What we want to do is just disseminate and let go of it and it takes on a life of its own and it turns out much better than anything you could expect. All right, just don't expect anything. Yeah. But just do yeah. It. For instance, <laughs> for instance, with the depleted uranium bill, the first one passed by a state legislature, the federal government has had a cover up since 1991 on depleted uranium. And so I said, I'm not going to work at the federal level. It's a waste of time. I think I'll go to the state legislatures and see if I can push from the bottom up. The more people you have involved, the more they respond. They respond to numbers and they respond to angry citizens. So I went to New Orleans. I talked about the bill in an anti-war rally. I waved all these pictures of Iraqi babies around and that was good bait. This, this uh, Vietnam veteran walked up to me and he said, give me that bill. So I gave it to him. He went to the state legislature a week later in Louisiana, this is three years ago, with another veteran. They found one black legislator and one white legislator in, Louis in the Louisiana legislature, and they're very conservative there and very corrupt. And uh, I didn't even know they were doing that. And they said, hey, white out Connecticut and write in Louisiana and don't change anything in the bill. It was passed unanimously, even an American general voted for it on the Veterans Committee in the, in the Louisiana legislature. Three months later, the governor signed it into law. That was the first state legislature depleted uranium bill, and they're 57 now. There are 20 in the Hawaiian legislature. Now, I was involved in that one, but I wasn't involved in any of the others. Hollywood, the Hollywood movie star crowd read all our stuff. They wanted their own bill, and Arcata, a hippie, pot-smoking, pot-growing village in Northern California, they wanted their own bill. So that's what I mean. Do what you can do and let go of it. And let people empower people by letting them alone to figure out what to do about it themselves. Let them be creative. Yes, yes comment about um, feeling crazy, sharing the information yes. with other people, yes. other people thinking you're crazy because you're talking about this. I recently heard Alan Watt talk on a radio show where he said that the CIA's, or NSA, I forget which, uh -huh. their own statistics show that, that only 46% of people when confronted with something horrific like 9-11 will actually uh -huh. believe their own eyes. Yeah. So we are in the minority. But I don't even care whether people can see or not. I just right. blast this stuff out there and I let go of it and, and they say, wait a minute, you can't leave now. And I said, no, I put a Velcro patch on your brain and now you have to educate yeah. yourself. They, Bye. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned two things last night in your lecture I'd like yes. to ask you about. DU has the, a, a real specific effect on the brain and upon uh, people getting fat and <laughs> overweight. Yes. So could you explain okay. the connection? Environmental uranium in drinking water, it's poisoning all the drinking water all over the world, at levels below the EPA standard. In other words, the federal government believes these levels are safe. It's an estrogen and a hormone disruptor. So by disrupting the hormone insulin, it causes diabetes. And when you start disturbing hormones and estrogen, these are information signals. These are molecules or signals that carry information to the cells and the glands in the body and control their function. So when you start disturbing hormones, you're causing diabetes is one of the causes. I mean, diabetes is one of the diseases that are caused by disrupting hormones. Insulin. Um, disturbing estrogen causes infertility and reproductive cancers. 
that is why we've had an epidemic of breast cancer, uter uterine cancer, and ovarian cancer, and prostate cancer since 1945 when bomb testing started. They stopped bomb testing for Russia, the U.S., and Britain in 1963 with a partial test ban treaty, but they, re 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 they replaced the radioactive pollution from bomb testing with nuclear power plants. And then in 1991, they introduced depleted uranium, which has gone all over the world. The depleted uranium, L, the Los Angeles Power and Water started measuring uranium in drinking water in 1998. In 2007, in one year alone, we did so many airstrikes in Iraq and Afghanistan just in the month of July that the uranium level in drinking water in Los Angeles doubled in one year. And that came from Iraq? And Afghanistan in two weeks. So how does it affect the uh, bodies, the, bo the brain? What, okay, the there are, there, oh, well, when you disturb the hormones yeah. and the estrogen, um, you, you um, disturb the information flow, and so things start functioning, dis they become dysfunctional, and, and obesity is part of it. So, so part of, so this obesity you know, is... Us being found as evidence of... Obesity and heart disease are, um, are cofactors with diabetes. Or they're all symptoms, diseases that, are, that occur together. 25% of China now is obese. They weigh like 300 pounds. How could that happen? since 1991, when they eat a bowl of rice a day. I've gone through China on a train. I saw them eating a bowl of rice a day because they were standing right by the railroad tracks. Um, so did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Oh, good. OK. So what I want to read to you is these, the covers from these harp audios. These are $5 each. You can also download them from the internet from um, uh, Alfred Weber's site. I, I can't remember what it is right now, but I, I can figure it out. This is the first interview, HARP, a space-based weapon of mass destruction. So on it, I discuss the 1995 Japan Kobe earthquake, the 2001 FEMA foreshadowing, the 2005 Hurricane Katrina, the 2006 Sumatra earthquake and tsunami, 2007 Black Sea storm, the 2007 Niigata Japanese earthquake, the 2008 Myanmar cyclone, the 2008 China earthquake. And there were economic reasons or cofactors for all of these events. And with the, um, the uh, Kashmir earthquake, Somebody heard my interview, and he sent me the satellite data from five Los Alamos nuclear weapons lab satellites the five days before the Kashmir earthquake. And you could see how they turned on the antenna and beamed uh, for three hours every day, and the, the earthquake popped on the fifth day exactly at the uh, end of the three hour interval that they had pumped in every day for five days. So that was the satellite data from Los Alamos that showed how they did it. So people help me. See if we all talk and we bring out things that we observe then other people start talking and remembering and observing and then pretty soon we have a whole lot of information. We each have pieces of that information, but we don't know how to make sense out of it. So we need to work together. We can't do it on a, our, our, our own. Okay. We, yes. we, also, we also need to uh, not be complacent and procrastinate because one of the things that uh, has enormously enabled us in uh, the past decade or so to communicate with one another is the internet, and that's yes. a fragile resource. Yes, yes, and it's going to be coming under more and more control. But, you know all those teenagers that drove us crazy? <laughs> Our kids? Well, they're the answer, because they can rip a hole through the, the, the internet 
they can shut down government websites. They've already done it to punish the FBI and the Pentagon for chasing them around the Internet. And um, they're way ahead of any military or intelligence agency. It's our teenagers are the weapon of mass destruction that we need to empower to counteract the government. I'm not kidding. Yeah, I know. Isn't it great? Yeah, it's our teenagers. And the younger, the better. You're right. This is uh, the second interview, HARP. I call it Zionist science, and boy, did that make them mad. This is what it's used for. Missile defense, communications disruption, subsurface mineral exploration, rogue waves, tectonic events, that means earthquakes and causing volcanoes to trigger. You know what's happening in Yellowstone now? That might be HARP, one of their experiments. Weather modification and mind control. And on this is the patent on the technology uh, or the science uh, that HARP is, the principle that HARP is based on. Um, and Dr. Eastland, who uh, did the patent, worked for an oil company. Yeah. On, the, on YouTube, uh, recently, within the last couple of months, there was um, an acknowledgement by the, the parliamentarian of the Japanese parliament that the, that the United States threatened HARP on them. Yeah, threatened them with an earthquake machine. An earthquake, earthquake. Yeah. And then there was yeah. a small earthquake. Yeah. We're blackmailing, that was, at blackmailing Ni that was at Niigata, and it caused the shutdown of an earth, uh, a nuclear power plant on the, east, uh, on the west side of Japan. Yeah. yeah. This is HARP weather modification, this is number two, and this is uh, foreshadowing the FEMA prediction, land grab, Hurricane Katrina, energy war, Black Sea storm, famine, Myanmar cycle. So this is the application or the goal of uh, the, the type of destruction that they use those different events to accomplish. It's all geopolitical stuff. How can I steal your stuff and wreck your life? Can you make any comments about the uh, American Union? Yeah, that's all part of the land grab. And President Reagan signed an executive order that divided the United States into 10 regions, executive regions. And what they want to do is to abolish the states, get rid of government where any democratic form of government where people are voting or participating in federal or state government. And they want to set it up as executive regions where somebody like Paul Brenner in Iraq is running our region in California, Nevada, Utah, Oregon, and Washington. And that's why they're privatizing right now uh, emergency responders. And in the Santa Barbara fires that just happened, they um, did a whole bunch of new contracts the federal government did to hire KBR and um, who are those guys who shoot people from bridges in Katrina Blackwater? Yeah, so they're privatizing our emergency responders. And they're trying to fuse our police and firefighters into the military and intelligence agencies. So they'll be working against us instead of helping us. They, they won't even be under our control. The cities will be provided, will be ordered to provide them and pay their salaries, but they'll have no control over them. Well, they're trying to do that with the EU constitution in Europe. Every country in the EU that signs that constitution, and all of them have to sign it, they're required to maintain militaries that they have no control over, and they will be under NATO, under U.S. command. So it's just turning the whole world into cannon fodder, and we're just breeders for more cannon fodder. Except it's our children. So is the is the this un, American Union is it going forward? Is it being established without the knowledge of the American? Well, that's why they collapsed the Minnesota Bridge. That's part of the NAFTA Highway. That's one of the important bridges. And Judy Wood went up and looked at it during the Madison, Wisconsin. 
conference, 9-11 conference, and she came back and said, it's an engineering impossibility for every section of that bridge to exactly collapse or fail at the same time. It has to be a domino type collapse or uh, a cascade or a chain reaction or whatever, but she said, the whole bridge can't collapse at one time every section with, without any cause. So that, and she said there are a lot of similarities with the takedown of the World Trade Center buildings and the collapse of the Minnesota Bridge. Well, that's when the electricity gets cut off in my house during interviews. They don't like me talking about Judy Wood and the, and the Minnesota Bridge, the Minneapolis Bridge. Now, the reason they collapsed it is they need a disaster with that bridge to declare eminent domain of all the pr private property <laughs> under that bridge and around that bridge where they want to build the super NAFTA highway from Mexico to Canada. Oh, well, they want to put the, bridge, the, the super highway right through Minneapolis? Yeah. That's insane. No. <laughs> That's how it is. That's what they want to do. That's my hometown. I was born there. It's not insane. It's what they want to do. It's up to us to stop it. And you know what USA Today said three, three days later? I cut it out. USA Today said that the bird nests attached to the bridge, under the bridge, were full of bird guano and bird droppings and that was such a stress on the bridge that it collapsed the whole bridge. Oh. <laughs> that was, that was the official it was bird shit that did it. Is that the government explanation? <laughs> That's USA Today. <laughs> which is the government. Uh. Okay, this is, oh, did you have a question? Anybody else have a comment? Well, while you're talking, yeah. may I circulate this? this sure. Is a, this is a support petition to keep the, or most of you probably signed it, and I want to turn in a couple of days to keep the Oregon National Guard from being deployed to Afghanistan. Yeah. And you have the governor very much in support of that. And we talked to the people who've been sitting outside the legislature for months um, promoting that. Go ahead. So, do you want to explain it anymore? No, it's, okay. No, it's okay. very simple. You don't have to be yeah. a registered Be sure they have a pen with it. They something have something to write with. Okay. okay. It would be just to wait until we listen to the president. It's okay oh, if it, she. It's, just very it's okay. Don't it's just somebody's. It's okay. You don't need to be a registered voter to yeah. sign yeah. it. It's okay. Just you sign it. Whether you want to or not, just sign it. <laughs> <laughs> This is a democracy. <laughs> this is an executive democracy. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to read a couple more of these labels just to give you an idea of the HARP applications. Okay, this is HARP and weather modification for famine. The Iowa floods on June 10th were to cause famine. And the flooding continued all the way down the Mississippi River, which was multiplying the fam famine effects of that flood in Iowa. Forest decline. This is the, the dry lightning that occurred all over California and caused hundreds of, of, of uh, forest fires. Well, I found the foreshadowing event, it was dry lightning drills on June 10th in British Columbia. I found them on a Royal Canadian Mounted Police website. They were practicing, they were foreshadowing in British Columbia and then on um, June, in June and July, 10 days later, they did the dry lightning in Northern California and, and they, were, they did it in all the counties in Northern California. They're like maybe um, maybe 25 dry lightning storms in California a year. They were having uh, three or four hundred in one hour or 45 minutes in every county in Northern California. Um, <clears throat> tectonic warfare. I talked about the Kashmir earthquake, October 8, 2005. 
the depopulation of the Himalayas and the Los Alamos satellite data. Um, this stuff is just, it's really fun. I just, um, Alfred says, gee, let's do another one. And, and so I, by that time, I've collected more information. And man, I'm pretty excited about these interviews. This is much more than Nick Begich was real, willing to say. Yeah, this is, uh, he froze. Yeah. And um, this is Harp, Echoside, and the Arctic Gold Rush. The Arctic Gold Rush is for black gold. It's for oil and natural gas that's under the Arctic ice cap. So, um, this is, HARP is being used to melt the Arctic ice cap. So it's giving access to natural resources under the Arctic ice cap and the U.S. forest decline. What it's doing is causing a forest decline all over the U.S. The trees are dying. And what I found out is the city of London bankers traded half of a, a gold and uranium company to Sir, Sir, Sir Jimmy Goldsmith. He owned all the timber rights for the whole United States. So he traded the timber rights at some, you know, poker table in London at a men's club for half of a uranium and gold gold mining company. Newmont Mining, yes. It, it sounds as if um, the global, global warming hysteria campaign could be a cover for some of the... Oh, it's, it's out now. H hundreds and hundreds of scientists have signed um, petitions, and it's now really out that, that Al Gore is just a big bullshitter. He's a big okay. liar, and, and there is no global warming going on. There are parts of the Earth that are warming up. HARP is being used to melt the Arctic, and his global warming agenda is being used to promote nuclear power. My, my article on um, global warming, and I'm a global warming denier. Uh -huh. I just published the other day on Profit had 250,000 hits. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Now, I have another little interesting tidbit, if you like juicy, juicy details. Um, Al Gore, oh, there is a meeting every year under the Arctic ice cap. A submarine from the United States and a submarine from Russia meet under the Arctic ice cap and these heavy duty people um, plan what is going to happen the next year. Remember, they are partners, Russia and the U.S. are harp partners. And Al Gore in his movie, An Inconvenient Truth, is that what it is? He boasted, I am the only vice president in the United States who ever went under the Arctic ice cap in a submarine. Oh, what a giveaway. What a giveaway. Absolutely he knows. Absolutely he knows. One other point in that context. Um, there's a, a Russian, um, I'm, I'm not sure what his position is, but he's, he's famous for having a decade or so ago predicted the breakup of the United States. And he's reintroduced, he's reiterated recently that uh, uh, prediction based on uh, the, the world economy and the U.S. economy. And he's, he's famous for having said that the United States is going to break up into about eight different yeah. sections. And part of his prediction is that uh, Alaska will revert back uh, uh, to Russian control. And of course, that's where HARP is located. Yeah, ex exactly. They have the seven biggest transmitters. Chernobyl powered one of them. Chernobyl is the word for wormwood. And in the Bible, an event called wormwood was a global event that poisoned the whole world and killed millions of people. That's in the Bible. And a an Indian admiral, who's a very good friend of mine, he's the father of the Indian submarine, Admiral Bhagwat, told me, Loren, uh, he whispered it, he said, Loren, I have investigated nuclear power plants, inspected them all over Russia. He said, it's impossible for Chernobyl to have been an accident. Twelve safety measures, levels of safety measures, had to be first dismantled in order, one at a time, in order for Chernobyl to happen. He said all the workers were drunk in Chernobyl the night that happened. He said they did that to take down the Soviet Union to end the Cold War. So, see, that's, that's part of HARP involved with geopolitics. I mean, it's all integrated. You can't separate it. It's all connected. 
and it's connected to people and places and money and to minerals and it's just all connected. It's a big spider web around the world and we're caught in that spider web. Um, depopulation, this is chemical and radiation poisoning. These chemtrails, vaccines, genetically modified organisms, depleted uranium, these are actually binary and trinary weapon systems where a component in one is introduced like the, um, the pesticides or the chemicals and the chemtrails and it's fairly benign but then when another element is introduced for instance the depleted uranium from uh, the weapon systems or um, maybe some genetically modified molecule or chemicals in a crop when they interact they become extremely toxic so these are binary and trinary weapons that are secret and we think they're ordinary things and not not very harmful but when they combine they have very very deadly effects and what they're doing is they're using chemtrails to depopulate. It's to increase the death rates by killing off the weak, the elderly and the diseased and the very young and they're causing fetal deaths before they're even born the babies are dying or when they're born they're weak babies and they die so um, these are all just absolutely demonic uh, projects and plans but why did Rumsfeld build hundreds of bioweapons labs if he wasn't going to develop bioweapons and use them against us? Um, let's see. Um, and, and what they're causing is infer infertility and reproductive cancers. So 80% of men's sperm today has damaged DNA. Only, well, it's 85% and only 15% is normal. It's all bad with the sperm now. That's what the scientists say. 20 years ago, 80% of sperm was normal and only 20% had damaged DNA. <laughs> and it's also causing the DU is an estrogen and a hormone disruptor. And what it's causing in fish populations, in polar bears, in human males, is when they're born, they're male, but they go through a, uh, a hormone change and they turn to females. So we have shrinking male populations and expanding female populations. But some of the females, like the polar bears in the Arctic, they have female genitalia, but they also have micropenises. They have male genitals too. And so I really think they're making a big mess. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't these people know that they're ruining their own world that they live in? I don't think they even care. Yeah, I mean, you're trying to be logical again with insanity. Stop that. <laughs> Tom. You're trying to make a square peg fit into a round hole and it ain't going to work. Time you do that. These, these very same people are also the major promoters of the environmentalist movement. The fake. Oh, oh, the Rockefellers started the environmental movement so they could control it. Um, famine, the chemtrails are killing fish in lakes and rivers. This is what indigenous, the native populations eat and we eat them too. Harp is being used on DQ University the Native American University in uh, Northern California next to UC Davis. This is where not just California Indians, but um, Hispanics, they're Indians too, and um, other Indians from around the United States. It's, it's the only co Indian college in the United States. They're using HARP on them. Yes? Lauren, I, I was, this is a comment about last night. Yes. You got several questions uh, last night that I sort of was reflecting on today yes. about, um, you know, it reminded me of the old 1950s uh, nuclear, you know, scare where people were supposed to dig holes in their backyard and make, you know, it, we had several yeah. people last 
last night, you know, what what kind of a pill could I take yeah. so that I could survive this? And Oxycontin, get happy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, it, it, it's just a, almost a uh, automatic reflex. I know. You know. How can I save myself? And really, it's not the direction we really need to be going. Is First of all, we need to not be afraid. If we're paralyzed for, with fear, we can't really advocate for ourselves or help anyone else. I'm not afraid. I want to know about all this stuff. I'm very, very curious. I think it's really interesting. I think everyone should know. I want to inform people, and I want to inform them in a way that they're not frightened. I want to empower them. I don't want to intimidate them. And I think the way I present information, the way I talk to people, um, has really empowered a lot of people. And that makes me really happy. But the people trying to control us don't want us empowered. And so we need to remember not to be afraid. And so when you stay at a spiritual level and you're in your spiritual energy, they can't touch you. Spiritual power is greater than any military power. That's why they want to deface us, they want to silence us, they want to frighten us, they want to desex us. Sexuality is beautiful. It's what re-energizes and recharges us. It's really about how we feel about ourselves. And so um, they're trying to take all of that away. They're trying to take away wild reproduction. Pretty, a lot of couples have to go to hospitals now to get pregnant. Not you, but... Um, <laughs> but um, I'm just kidding. Um, so that's why they're going in and carpet, bit it, carpet bombing and grid bombing all of the antiquities and all of the artistic and cultural history of countries. They destroyed everything in Iraq. They destroyed everything in Afghanistan. They destroyed everything in Yugoslavia. And they're going to destroy everything in the United States. Everything that's beautiful. Truth and beauty go together. Yes? I was just, I was just wondering, again, why, why, did they, why do they want to destroy all the museums and everything? They, they want to destroy our cultural history. They want to destroy the history of our identity. Our identity is expressed in our art. Our identity is ex expressed in our clothing and, and the ornament on our clothing. And when you look at indigenous people, they have a lot of detail in their clothing. They have beautiful tattoos. The Maoris in New Zealand, the tattoos are their whole genealogy for hundreds and hundreds of years. But I mean, Iraq, that's the center of, of world civilization. That's why they bombed it into rubble. And so they wanted, to, they wanted to destroy their very own They want to history? kill the mother and the father of truth and beauty and identity. But that's their, own, that's their own heritage right there. No, they hate it. They hate humanity. They hate themselves. <coughs> they hate truth and beauty. Wow. They want to kill everything so they can have it all. That's what they want to do. Don't ask me why. But that's what they want to do. Look at their actions. What have they done in every country? They've destroyed everything. Well, for one thing, if, uh, if you've got people um, reading uh, classic literature, uh, then they're not paying attention to, to uh, Britney Spears. And if they're, uh, they're not spending their money at a mall if they're <coughs> sitting home listening to classical music. Right, or, or if they're drinking the wine that their neighbor made, uh, they're not drinking Coca-Cola. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, oh, yeah, and the ocean dead zones. Ha how many people have heard about the ocean dead zones? They're off of uh, uh, Oregon, too. What I did was I looked at a map of ocean dead zones and a map of nuclear power plants. And guess what? The ocean dead zones, most of the ocean dead zones, especially on the west coast of the United States, they are all from nuclear facilities. So that's killing the fish in the ocean. 
Yes. Uh, you mentioned the, the Large Hadron reactor yes. at CERN. Yes, at CERN. Can you integrate what you think it's oh, I think with it's, HARP and some It's part of HARP. It's definitely part of HARP. This is big science, and these big science projects are international consortiums providing money and scientists and resources for them, and they're not just doing it for fun. <laughs> they're doing it so they can misapply it and use it against us, because that's the pattern all through history. So leopards don't change their spots. I want to remind you that like I said, at Lincoln High School, you have to finish with a, a happy face. Oh, yes, I will. I will. Okay. I will. Giving people hope. Okay, this is HARP and elections. So this is how they use HARP on elections. HARP applications in elections. Mood control and mind control. Behavior modification. They can make candidates or whatever do things that discredit them or enhance them or whatever. Voting machine manipulation. Yeah, yeah. HARP election application is for the bankers. And it's to create an election smoke and mirrors to dupe the public into thinking they're participating in a democracy. The Republicans and the Democrats are the same party. Yeah. That's why they won't let any other independent parties Horn in on their dirty little game. This is HARP in 9-11. This is the energy budget, such as the seismic record, molecular dissociation, nanoparticles. Uh, also the evidence of HARP in beam weapons, the satellite photos, the rusted steel, steel doesn't rust, the lathering up is in Judy's woods of these buildings before they collapsed. Building 7 was lathering up before the two World Trade Center buildings collapsed. So this is some kind of an energy environment that's causing a molecular or a physical change. What do you mean by lathering? Um, there's just this weird lathering look. Uh, it looks like soap suds or something. Yeah, on the outside of the building. And then the World Trade Center buildings were doing that too. But Building 7 was lathering up before the two World Trade Center buildings had even collapsed. So it's a technology that they were using on all three buildings. And it, is, it has something to do with the collapse and the molecular dissociation of the buildings. Um, and then the Minneapolis Bridge collapse, which I mentioned. And, um, and then I did, oh, and this is harp and mind control. So this is HARP and the Woodpecker Signal, the joint, which was a joint U.S.-Soviet secret project. Edward Teller, Nelson Rockefeller, and George Herbert Walker Bush were all big, big players in the mind control empire. MK Ultra was a CIA project, and it was controlled by Skull and Bones. Skull and Bones was very involved in it. That's the shadow government. Now. The American Psychology Association, every single member of the American Psychology Association was, was started by Skull and Bones in the 1860s or 70s. Uh, every single scientist, every member was involved in MK Ultra. They were giving LSD to kids, they were erasing their memories, they were doing horrible things to them. These are the evil scientists that I'm talking about, and they are evil, except for me. <laughs> um, IEEE, the International Electrical Engineers, uh, um, anyway, their, their organization, they have even published a book with all of the scientific research papers that were written as part of the HARP mind control research on the technology. The electrical engineers. Anybody an electrical engineer here? We need to get that book. Um, they were all contractors and universities. You won't believe how many universities were involved in all of this. They can't do it without the universities. The universities are all total crap. It's just a bunch of lies. Right on. And don't forget 
the university is not the classroom, the university is the library. So anyone who has access to a library can have a university degree. And I was recently in an inner city documentary film and this black kid who had been murdering people and, you know, running drugs, his sister was going to college, she said, brother, why don't you just stop all this stuff and get a college education? And he said, because, sister, I've got a Ph.D. Pimps plus hoes equal dollars. <laughs> I've got a Ph.D. <laughs> Livermore Safe House. Um, now, the man that I interviewed, the Project Artichoke um, victim, he saw Sirhan Sirhan at that safe ho house in Livermore three days before the Bobby Kennedy assassination. And so, Sirhan Sirhan was CIA MK Ultra, of course. Uh, Stanford, UC Berkeley, and Livermore Lab are all uh, the three biggest CIA centers in the Bay Area, they were all involved in HARP and mind control and MK Ultra, LSD, uh, all that goofy stuff. And what I discovered when I googled Edward Teller plus Rockefeller, I found a photo of Edward Teller and Nelson Rockefeller at UC Davis in the 60s. And I was there then and I said, that's what the monkey colony was for at UC Davis. They did the animal studies for mind control in the monkey colony at UC Davis. And all these students who worked there used to tell me, oh my God, it's so horrible. They've cut the top of the heads off of the monkeys. They have all these antennas and electrodes coming out of their heads. And they would control them with radios and make them go up and down, climb up and down cages all time, all day long or for hours. They could make them do all kinds of things. So, UC Davis is where the animal studies were done. So, what's the name of this? You can't have this one because it'll scare you. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to get it because I want you to understand how logical it is. <laughs> I'm just teasing everyone. And then these are two, um, this is a, a two-hour interview that I did with a CIA radio host. It's called Parker's Pathways. And um, he, he evaluated intellectual material for the CIA, for the U.S. government, for the World Health Organization, and the Pentagon for 32 years. And man... By the end of this interview, he was like practically breathless, and he told me later he had 2,000 emails from countries all over the world, especially scientists in Germany, from in Germany, about this interview. He said it's the best interview I've ever done. So, if German scientists are listening to the information that I'm putting out, ah. Uh, I must be talking about something that that yeah. is valid and it is logical <laughs> even though it's insane <laughs> there's a little contradiction so I'm going to put DVDs out these are all the audio CDs on harp these are five dollars each um, and and then I have these these other DVDs I, I have some 9-11 DVDs and um, just just have fun. These are all 20. And I'll just throw them on the table. Um, and believe me, I'm sorry to be the messenger. This is a horrible message. <laughs> but it's insane, but it's really happening. Ooh. So any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Now, now. The grand finale, your dessert is when we can turn this off, the radiation, the depleted uranium, the nuclear power plants, uh, and HARP, the earth will heal itself. And it heals itself very, very quickly. 50% of the fishing catch in the North Atlantic 
declined within seven years of the heavy bomb tests in Nevada. In 1963, it had declined 50%. As soon as they turned off the bomb testing, in four years, the fishing catch over-recovered. It was twice as high as before the, um, the bomb testing started. And then it came back into balance or equilibrium with, with the, the biosphere or the, the ocean environment. So it does, the earth will heal itself very, very quickly. But it's us up to us to stop these technologies and this insanity. And we can. Thank you very much. Oh, you're really welcome. Would you like some opium now? <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, my dear. And if anybody wants to do more contributions, yes, to Lauren. Lauren. Thank you. Oh, oh, great.